very recently. I worked at the Eagleton Institute of Politics at Rutgers and retired, and I now spend a lot of time with a new website, njspotlight.com, which focuses on New Jersey issues. I'm uh, Dr. Barry Backenheimer. I'm a director of curriculum instruction at Pascat Valley Regional High School. I'm Steve Dahl, an attorney with K. Hovnany and Holmes. Okay, so uh, I believe at this point you guys know the drill pretty well, but this is Unit 3. And the question that you'll be responding to is, and so oh, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I am so sorry. Yeah. My apologies. I wanted to give you guys nice name tags. Absolutely. My apologies, please. Good morning. My name is Maria Guerra. Good morning. My name is Margaret Clifford. Good morning. My name is Victoria Good morning. My name is 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 Abdel and we're here with our teachers, Mr. Roger and Mr. Thank you very much. Well, this is a U.S. history class. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Very good. So, where I left off, and I apologize for, for jumping in early. Uh, the quote that you are responding to is the weakening of the older social hierarchy and the erosion of traditional belief and elite rule made the rise of political parties both necessary and possible. Do you agree or disagree with this opinion recently expressed by an American scholar? What evidence can you offer to support your position? How would you distinguish between a faction and a political party? How important is that distinction? And how do political parties in a democracy differ from ideological parties? And why are those differences important? You can begin when you're ready. Gordon Wood, an American scholar, affirmed, the weakening of the older social hierarchy and the traditional belief in elite rule make the rise of political parties both necessary and possible. This panel agrees with Wood. To plan in high demand for workers in the new world usually meant that American colonists had greater opportunity to achieve prosperity than most Europeans. Unlike Europe, Americans did not hold titles of nobility. For the first time in recent history, control of the government was given to a new leader as a result of an electoral revolution rather than by hereditary secession. In his book, The Creation of the American Republic, Gordon Wood emphasized, the creation of a new political theory was not as much a matter of liberation as it was a matter of necessity. 10 years after the revolution, the delegates from the 13 states gathered in Philadelphia and created the Constitution. In this document, political parties were not mentioned. Soon after, two factions emerged. The group led by Alexander Hamilton was known as the Federalists. They favored business development, a strong national government, and a loose interpretation of the Constitution. The other group led by Thomas Jefferson was known as the Republicans. They believed in society based on small farms, a relatively weak central government, and a strict interpretation of the Constitution. On February 12, 1798, Jefferson wrote, Two political sects have arisen within the U.S., the one believing that the executive is the branch of our government, government which needs support, the other that, like the analogous branch of the English government, it is already too strong for the Republican parts of the Constitution. The purpose of these parties was and still is to influence governmental policies. In Federalist 10, a faction is defined as a number of citizens, whether matched to a majority or minority of the whole, or united by some common impulse or passions or of interest, adverse to the rights of common citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. For example, if a faction is made up of a minority, a democracy could work well because the majority could outvote the faction. Madison argued that good representatives refine the public's views by filtering ideas that are based strictly on self-interest. The latent causes of faction are thus sown in the nature of man. In this quote found in Federalist 10, Madison expressed that the need of man to express his so voice and opinions is a natural instinct, making factions impossible to avoid. Madison explained the benefits of a large, diverse republic. A large nation is likely to have so many different factions that none will be able to none will be able to command the majority. Therefore, they will cancel each other out. George Washington, dismayed by the quarreling between Hamilton and Jefferson in his cabinet, devoted much of his farewell address to condemn parties. Washington warned, sooner or later, the chief of some prevailing faction, more able or fortunate than his competitors, turned his disposition on the purposes of his own elevations on the roads of public liberty. He believed that one party may become too powerful, much like the branches of the government. Political parties want their philosophy to be reflected in public policy. Currently, the Tea Party is a faction of the Republican Party, which endorses reduced government spending, opposition to taxation, reduction of national debt, and a strict interpretation of the Constitution. Political parties in the democracy differ from ideological parties. Political scientist James M. Danziger asserted ideological parties hold major programmatic goals and are deeply committed to the implementation of these goals to achieve comprehensive changes in the social political order. In other words, he states that a democratic political party is more pragmatic as it strives to achieve its goals, whereas an ideological party is idealistic in principle. 
In recent times, the Democratic and Republican parties have become influenced by ideological parties. For example, the Progressive Party had many ideas that were implemented by the Republican Party. These include direct election of senators, women's right to vote, and the income tax. Generally, the conventional ideological parties will not budge and are only willing to accept ideas that coincide with their beliefs. Money is not a priority for them. Hence, as emphasized by John DiGiulio, an expert on American government, the traditional parties value winning above all else. The ideological parties value principle above all else. Our panel believes that Madison will have approved of these differences to achieve the various interest groups in check. For some time, we have been uh, wedded to a two-party system. Why do you think that is, and do you see the prospect for a viable third party down the road? Well, I think that the two-party system is a great system here in America, but I also believe that a third party should uh, appear, and many have appeared throughout history, such as the, the Green Party, Progressive Party, party and they all uh, their platforms all really uh, uh, set the basis for um, America and the other two parties because many of the two parties usually get uh, many of their ideas from third parties and they've contributed a bunch to our system. For example, um, Strom Nordstrom in 1940 he was um, he was belonged to the state's right third party and he won 2.4% of the popular vote and 39 elect electoral votes. So as you can see that he did steal some votes from the Republican and Democratic parties. Ron Cuban said, a business owner, he said one of the biggest curses in the United States is that we only have two, uh, uh, two parties. I, I wish that there would be a third party down the road, but we, the, way the, electoral, the, the way the electoral college works, it's basically only going to be a two-party system. Third party, uh, third parties cannot really win, but they can have an impact. I, I believe that third parties are um, great because um, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are the uh, two main uh, parties. However, third parties can share their ideas, and if the Democrats or the Republicans feel that those ideas they can incorporate, then they can do that. With, um, with Mutually two-party system, we are currently in gridlock, and Washington stated that the American people don't believe that anything's going to be done this year, next year, or the year after because Washington put Going back to what my teammate Arsani said about a third party having the opportunity to make it into the presidential election, I don't believe that it's possible. However, we have seen uh, uh, we have seen it in the past where third parties <coughs> have gotten their ideas out. For example, in the election of 1912. Theodore Roosevelt ran as a third party candidate for the Progressive Party and received 17.5% of the electoral votes. And Peter Kameho, yeah, he's also a businessman, he said that um, much of what we see in America today, what most people see as progress and good things, has been brought upon by the existence of third parties. Like the Progressive Party and other parties, they, if it wasn't for them, then women, women wouldn't really have as much rights as as uh, men who were back in the day, they had more rights than women. Uh, let's uh, uh, take a look at the media uh, that we're living in today. People have observed that um, there's more focus, a lot of focus on individuals and not a lot of focus on parties. Uh, and some people think that's good for democracy and some people think that undermines democracy, that we'd be better off with a focus on um, uh, more of an agenda of the platform. What do you think? Um, if we're talking about the media, uh, writer John Avalon said, the two parties are still more polarized today than they ever were before, and the rise of the parties the media is an important reason for that. And this is important because our, the media, the way things are getting out, is controlling a lot of what happens in, in our government. Uh, today in government, we see a huge polarization between the two political parties. And that's showing in the American people because uh, some Americans, uh, when they vote, they usually, uh, it, it's just a vote based on what they see and not what they know. And uh, uh, for example, uh, Americans today, they it, some are uh, extreme liberals or liberals, or, and the other side is uh, extreme conservative or, con or just conservative. And uh, the, a lot of citizens don't really, uh, aren't really educated 
but the uh, I think uh, the citizen plays a huge role, and uh, they ultimately decide uh, what happens. Uh, Norquist is a conservative, which said that the parties today are divided by principle, and uh, they whether you're supporting extreme democratic um, views, beliefs, or Republican extreme beliefs. Question just for Innis Bubble Group. How many by show of hands follow politics on social media? Uh, CNN. <laughs> <laughs> so, a uh, noted journalist recently said that because of social media, following things on the net, et cetera, has led to a decline in political parties and political use. Do you agree with this? Why or why not? Uh, I do agree because I believe uh, over time uh, political parties have uh, weakened because uh, usually uh, the, the citizen, when watching the media, is uh, uh, it, it can be, the media conveys uh, a lot of um, biased views, and th that uh, really affects how the citizen really uh, decides. And uh, uh, it, yeah. For example, in recent, recent primaries and caucuses, um, Rick Perry, or no, Mitt Romney has a, a very good super PAC where they donated money to get um, ads for negatively uh, other candidates and. That uh, is very biased view because you you can't a lot of times it's out of context and context and and it's not like the truth the truth and it's not right. Um, really to one of my teammate um, Margaret said, ninety percent of the ads are, are negative ads that are bashing other other uh, other people running for president instead of helping yourself you're bashing other people. <coughs> to elaborate on what my teammate Abdel said, um, in the pew. In a recent Pew Research study, it found that voters, voters don't feel that the views of the um, Democratic Party and the Republican Party are opposite of each other. Fifty-eight percent believes that the Democrats have either extreme, are extremely liberal or liberal, whereas fifty-six percent believes that the Republicans are extreme conservative or conservative? Um, uh, yeah. Out of time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can we stop here? Yeah, we'll pause at that point. Uh, we're getting off through some follow-up now. That's okay, some, uh, some comments. Okay. Uh, first of all, it, it's difficult working with as many people as you have on yeah. your panel. Yeah. Seven. 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 <laughs> and uh, so I, I really do want to compliment you on how you divided up your presentation and uh, actually each person did focus on a specific topic so that we could follow you uh, well. And, um, and it seemed as though you really were interested in what you yes. were uh, yeah. conveying to us. <laughs> and probably had some differences among you. Yeah. So I want to compliment you on that. And uh, with seven people, it's hard to have a very engaged conversation in whatever number of minutes it is. So, but I think you tried hard. I saw your eye contact with each other. Uh, trying to figure out who wanted to have a chance to speak. So I think you did a good job in the presentation. It's clear to me that you're all well grounded in our history. <laughs> you yes. you fought well and you obviously have a lot of enthusiasm for the topic. Um, likewise, you had an exceptionally well structured initial presentation where it's almost chronological starting from um, the beginnings of, of, the, of the political party system and where we are today. And I don't know if I suspect that was in some part by design, but I know it yeah. def definitely resonated with me. And, and then in answering the more specific questions, you were very good in giving specific am examples, whether it was uh, Theodore Roosevelt's uh, failed third party bid. Uh, and I thought it was a very insightful comment. Uh, um, Sonny, I think you made it as to uh, the electoral party or the electoral, electoral system frustrates a third party. Uh, I think that was a very insightful comment. Well done. Thank you. I want to tell you, 25 years ago, I was sitting in your seats. I was, uh, I was the first year of this competition 25 years ago. Uh, in 1987, uh, Warren Berger, who was a justice in the Supreme Court, set up this competition because he felt that high school students didn't know as much as they should about the U.S. Constitution. I want to start by complimenting your teachers and your parents because it's quite obvious to me that you guys know your Constitution and know it very well. Um, you were excited. You were enthusiastic. Um, you juggled seven people very well, as my colleague <laughs> too. Um, and the piece I enjoyed the most is how you really balanced well the 
the historical piece and current events, and the two marriage the two very well. And so uh, my compliments to you guys were very well prepared and presented very well.